Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm really excited about what we have for you today. What I have here is pretty much a complete collection of Mondragon rifles, uh, specifically the semi-auto model 1908 rifles. This was renowned as being the first semi-auto rifle actually adopted by a standard uh, mainstream country's military as an infantry rifle. They were adopted by Mexico in 1908. Now, they didn't end up seeing really any service in, with the Mexican army for a couple reasons, which we'll get to in a moment. But for that reason, they occupy this really cool place in history. And beyond that, they're just really cool guns. They're neat. Um, Manuel Mondragon, who designed this rifle, had a long history of firearms design. Uh, he had actually started decades before. And in particular, he developed the 1893 or 1894 straight pull Mondragon rifle. And that straight pull rifle has a significant influence on these semi-autos. So when we start looking at these up close, we're actually going to begin by comparing an 1894 Mondragon uh, straight pull bolt action rifle to this guy, which is an early model of 1900 Mondragon semi-auto. We're then going to take a look at this second rifle, which is the standard Mexican issue version of the Mondragon 1908. We're going to take a look at this one which is the version that SIG attempted to sell to the Germans during World War I. And then we're going to take a look at this one, which is kind of your standard, basic, very late Mondragon as uh, manufactured by SIG and probably not effectively sold to anybody. So what was going on here was the Mexicans initially ordered 4,000 of these rifles. SIG started making them. And it's still controversial exactly how many got shipped to Mexico. It was probably 500, maybe 1,000. And the Mexicans started using them, gave, you know, issued them out to troops and started using them. And what they discovered was the rifles are a little bit delicate. You know, this is 1908 with a self-loading rifle. This is quite early and it's a full power cartridge. They were chambered for seven millimeter Mauser. And, the, and with Swiss made good quality ammunition, they worked fine as long as they were clean. The problem was the ammunition that Mexico was manufacturing domestically was not up to nearly the quality of the Swiss ammo. And with Mexican ammunition, which wasn't all that great, these rifles did not work effectively. They had major problems with them. So the Mexicans started getting these problems and they basically called up SIG and said, this sucks, these rifles don't work. We can't use these, stop sending them, we're not paying for anymore. Which left SIG with a big pile of completed but unpaid for rifles and all the tooling that they had set up to make these and wasn't a good thing for SIG. Uh, SIG was left trying to figure out what do we do with all of these leftover Mondragon rifles. And they weren't really successful at selling them to anybody. Uh, they were in seven millimeter Mauser, which wasn't a super common cartridge at the time. I think a lot of countries assumed that these weren't gonna be reliable enough. They were fine when they're clean, but they probably wouldn't have met a lot of countries' military standards. And the, the guns kind of languished for about ten, nearly 10 years. Now, what SIG came up with as a, an option, an idea, was to try and sell these to the Germans as aircraft guns. And so that was the model of 1917. They took a standard Mondragon. They actually rebarreled them in 8mm Mauser to make them more attractive to the German military. Then they fitted a detachable box magazine, so you had a 12-round capacity instead of, I think, 8 was the standard capacity. Uh, and then they also fitted them with brass catching bags, the idea being if you're flying around with an observer firing in an airplane, you don't want spent brass to you know, go down the back of the pilot's shirt and cause him to, to freak out and spin the plane or something. So we've got one of those German rifles. And then lastly, we have one of the late converted rifles that was just left in the possession of SIG. All right, I think that covers the basic history of these rifles. So why don't we get into a closer examination and uh, start comparing these guns so you can see where they came from and how they developed. All right, guys, so this is a model of 1900. It's a self-loading Mondragon rifle, early, uh, possibly prototype. This is actually serial number two. I don't know how many they made of these, but it would not have been all that many. And this is an 1894 Mondragon bolt action uh, repeating rifle. Now, I should point out the president of Mexico in 1900 was Porfirio Diaz. Uh, the U.S. kind of had a, a not so great relationship with him. But what's interesting is Diaz was very much interested in guns. He was a gun guy. And this is why Mexico ended up with a self-loading uh, rifle as early as they did, was because he was really interested in them. Um, 
he would happily accept um, experimental or presentation firearms and was had a keen interest in them. And in fact, if you look on the, the top of the receiver of the 1908 rifles that Mexico actually received and issued, they are actually designated the Fusil Porfirio Diaz, the, the Porfirio Diaz rifle, as a way to try and curry favor with him. And there are a number of presentation Mondragons uh, presented to him. So the 1900 semi-auto Mondragon is in many ways an 1894 bolt action with a gas system added to it. The bolt is fundamentally pretty much the same. It has two sets of locking lugs, one at the front up here and one at the rear. Now the rear lugs on the self-loader are uh, hidden inside the receiver extension. On the bolt action rifle, the back end of the bolt sticks out. It's no big deal on a bolt action. On the semi-auto, they have extended the rear of the receiver, capped it um, to keep the whole thing captive. And you can see the bolt handles are very similar, even to the point of this hook built into the bolt handle. Now that hook actually serves a purpose in the self-loader because this right here is our operating rod that's connected to the gas system and also to the recoil spring. And if you squeeze this handle, you can detach the bolt and the bolt handle from that lug and actually operate the rifle as a single shot manual bolt action. Now the other similarity I'll point out here, which is this is a distinctive feature of the Model 1900, is that it still used end block clips. The 1894 rifles had used end block clips uh, holding six or possibly eight cartridges, depending on the model, and the 1900s used the same thing. So you can see there are cutouts in the follower there. That's to give space for the clip. And when you fired the clip empty, it would actually fall out here through the bottom of the magazine well. You also have this catch. This is your clip release catch. It's protected by two little hoops on the sides so that you don't accidentally trigger it. Um, all ideas built around the use of an end block clip. Now, if we take a closer look at the muzzle end of the 1900, there is no bayonet lug. You'll see a bayonet lug appearing on the later guns. But we do have a gas regulator uh, that does functions the same way as the later guns, although the style will change. So, so specifically what we have is this lever that unfolds like so, and then I can rotate it from one side of the rifle to the other. On this side, it's in semi-auto mode, and over on this side, it's actually disconnected the gas system, which allows you to use the rifle as a straight pull bolt action. Uh, this was a, a popular feature um, with a number of early semi-auto rifles, kind of along the lines of the magazine cutoff you see in bolt actions. Um, a way to conserve ammunition, keep, uh, keep troops at a, a lower rate of fire. You know, officers would, the theory is, officers would have the troops switch to manual action and then they could more easily control volleys and conserve ammunition. Now the other control here is this lever. This is the disassembly lever. so. What you do is rotate that vertical, then this pin comes out and you can pull the gas plug assembly off. That's a little tricky on this rifle and I'm gonna leave it alone, but that basic function remains constant through all the, the iterations of the self-loading Mondragon. So, all right, so what we have here now is our model 1900, which is the early developmental gun. And then we have an example of the 1908 Mondragon as it was actually shipped and issued to the Mexican military. It's got some really cool accessories with it. These actually were issued with a bipod, which I will extend out in just a moment. And they were also sent with bayonets. Now, the, you may be aware that the US issued some uh, trowel type bayonets. Well, the Mexican military did as well. Um, these are extremely rare bayonets and uh, really quite cool there. We'll, we'll put it up on the, the bipod with the bayonet here in a moment. But first, I want to take a look at the differences between the 1900 and the 1908. All right, so pretty much the most significant change uh, between the 1900 and the 1908 was the change in the type of feed system. The 1900 here used an end block clip. Uh, it actually used a 10 round end block clip, which is rather large. The 1908 changed that to a fixed box magazine. Uh, 
This is not a detachable mag. This is a, a fixed magazine well that has a Mauser style floor plate on it. And this magazine would also actually hold 10 cartridges. Uh, these are both in seven millimeter Mauser caliber. So kind of interesting that the capacity didn't change, but the type of magazine did. Sights remain the same on these two guns. Uh, you can see that the bolt handles, the style changed slightly, but the function did not. Um, and that pretty much goes with the rest of the gun. Uh, our safety here versus our early safety here, the style of the lever has changed slightly, but the function has not. You, uh, we do have some changes at the muzzle end of the gun. Now, you can see the 1900 is actually about two inches shorter than the 1908. The 1908 adds a bayonet lug for that cool trowel bayonet that you saw a moment ago. And then the style of this gas block mechanism has changed. Function is the same but the gas plug has been simplified here. The lever is bigger, has bigger serrations so that it's easier to access. Other than that, the guns work the same. Uh, same system of self-loading on one side and manually operated on the other. So new on the 1908 is this A marking, which indicates the automatic, or actually semi-automatic, side of the gas plug. So you don't have to try and remember which it is, it's actually marked. Semi-automatic function right there. The disassembly lever works the same way. Uh, rotate it vertical, pull it out, and then you can remove the gas plug. Something else I wanna take a quick look at while we're on this Mexican issue rifle is the Mexican crest here. Uh, the eagle with uh, a snake in its claws, standard national crest of the Mexican government. And we also have some engraving on the top of the receiver. Uh, this is a Fusil Porfirio Diaz, that's a rifle, model Porfirio Diaz, Sistema Mondragon, model of 1908, so it uses the Mondragon uh, mechanism, and these were manufactured by Fabrica de Armas de Neuhausen, Suiza, Switzerland. So here it is in all of its glory, the 1908 Mondragon as it was issued by the Mexican military. We've got our bipod, we've got our bayonet, to be honest, neither of those features are particularly ideal. Uh, trowel bayonets seemed like a good idea for a little while, but they turn out to be kind of crappy bayonets and definitely crappy trowels. The US tried them as well. This bipod is interesting in that it is really spindly and remarkably tall as well. Um, actually kind of reminds me of the monopod on an Arasaka in some ways, which is interesting. Uh, Arasakas were actually also purchased by Mexico around this same time frame. At any rate, the two legs operate independently. Um, you know, the other thing it works, it reminds me of is the Shosho uh, bipod, although the Shosho legs are actually significantly stouter than these. So that's how you'd use it. Uh, stand the guy up on the, the bipod. These are plain spikes at the bottom, so they would probably dig in, certainly in soft soil. Uh, you don't often see Mondragons with these bipods. They're a fairly rare accessory, and I think they probably discovered fairly early on that they just didn't work all that well. They weren't all that useful, and they got rid of them. I'm sure the same goes for the bayonet, although if you happen to be wandering around Mexico, I bet you will, from time to time, find these kind of rusty in garden sheds. Anyway, why don't we move on and take a look at what the SIG factory was able to try and market to the Germans to sell off some of these rifles after the Mexicans stopped paying for them. So by 1917, the SIG factory still had a whole bunch of these Mondragon rifles lying around. They hadn't been able to interest anybody else in buying them. The, the Mexicans obviously hadn't come back and decided to pay for them. And SIG decided to make an attempt at selling these to Germany. So this is 1917. There's, you know, there's this big war thing going on. And it seems a safe bet that maybe Germany, sitting right there next door to Switzerland, they might be interested in some self-loading rifles. So these, these hadn't really proven all that reliable in ground combat. They certainly would not have been in typical World War I trench warfare, but they probably work just fine in aircraft. So SIG made a number of modifications with the idea of selling these to Germany as aircraft rifles, either for observers to use from the the observer seat of aircraft or to uh, station on zeppelins. 
the, the changes that they made, they replaced this fixed magazine with a detachable box magazine. Now this only increased the capacity from 10 to 12, but it does allow you to remove the magazine uh, for much faster and much cleaner reloads. I don't think speed was so much the issue as the number of loose things floating around in an aircraft. They rebarreled the guns in 8mm Mauser. Obviously these had been in 7 Mauser, 8 was the standard German cartridge, so that makes a lot more sense. And then lastly, they added these brackets to the left side of the stock, which fit a brass catching bag. Of course, if you're in an aircraft, you don't really want to be throwing hot rifle brass into the pilot's face or clothing. So uh, being able to nicely contain your brass is a, a, a helpful idea. SIG converted a total of just 40 of these rifles for German use. It appears that the Germans took them and, and maybe tested them, but didn't buy any further ones. The issue was this was 1917, and they already had plenty of machine guns. They had a lot more firepower already than you would get with a self-loading rifle like the Mondragon. Of course, the MG0815 had been in production for some time now, in 1917, and it was an excellent gun. Uh, Germany had, several years before, developed synchronizer gear, so they had forward-firing machine guns and fighters way more effective than something like this would be. And this was just too little, too late. Uh, SIG failed to sell any significant number of guns to the Germans as a result of this attempt. But, hey, you know, it was a good shot. Something cool I want to point out here with these detachable magazines, the latch is actually on the magazine. We have a, a big old box magazine here. It's only a single stack magazine. That's why its capacity wasn't any bigger. Um, I figure probably because you had to, this extra thickness of metal that had to go inside the existing magazine well of the gun uh, made it too narrow for an effective double stack design. Obviously this had not been part of the intention when the guns were first developed. I do also want to point out that the magazine well on these German converted guns is identical to the magazine well on the Mexican guns. You can just barely see here, there's a little groove cut in the, the front of the magazine well, and this would take a standard Mauser style floor plate. The only difference between the, the fixed magazine guns and these detachable magazine guns is that they replaced the catch back here with a hooked one that the magazine could latch onto. So you may occasionally see uh, Mondragon rifles that have box magazines and they have a, like a solid stud here or some other type of catch that just doesn't hook onto the box magazine. The explanation behind that is someone has procured a standard Mexican rifle with one of the detachable magazines. Now they did also make a drum magazine, which held, I believe, 25 cartridges. Uh, for the same purpose, those are extremely rare items. Pretty cool, and, and for the same aerial use purpose as these single stack box magazines. So we've now looked at the, the developmental version. We've looked at the Mexican issue version. We've looked at the attempted sale to Germany version. And that kind of brings us to this last major variant of the 1908 Mondragon, which is one that has no external markings. It's not numbered. Um, in this case, only the bolt handle has a mark, has a number, and that's a little over a thousand. And it's actually located on the underside of the handle there. You have to disassemble it to see the number. And what's most distinctive about this is that it has been modified with this button. Now what this button does is you have to push it up and lock it in place in order to squeeze the handle here, which means this is basically a safety to prevent you from accidentally using the gun in single loading uh, mode. As long as this button is down, you are connected to the recoil spring and the operating rod here. So if you see a Mondragon with this button, it means that either it was a late assembled gun at SIG using parts that were originally manufactured for the Mexican contract but never shipped anywhere, or it is for some reason a gun that was sent back to SIG and, and retrofitted with this feature. Now it's, so the question remains, 4,000 were ordered. We don't really know how many of those 4,000 were manufactured. Uh, it could have been all 4,000. It could have been as small as something like 1,500. Uh, we know something like 500 or 1,000 of these went to Mexico. We know 40 were sent to Germany for testing. It's 
possible, it's rumored, although I haven't seen any definitive evidence, that Germany may have ordered more of them. Um, the people say that they were actually issued out in pairs to specific airship crews. Well, you know, airships suffered a fairly high rate of attrition during World War I, and rifles issued to them would have as well. So a lot of those rifles may have been destroyed there. But this really leaves open the question of how many more have been sitting in a warehouse in Neuhausen, and how many of those were sold one by one to various interested parties over the years? Were any, are there any still there? Who knows? Probably not, but maybe. Um, were any of them simply destroyed because it was costing more to store them than, than there was any hope of ever actually selling them? It's, there really isn't any good documentation on what ultimately happened to the remaining stock of Mondragon rifles, which makes this a, a pretty cool topic, uh, interesting little bit of mystery to, to wind up our video on this pretty awesome self-loading rifle. Thanks for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video. I hope I was able to uh, teach you something new about the Mondragon 1908 semi-auto. They're a, a very cool rifle with this very neat place in history, and there's not a whole lot of information out there about them. I consider myself very lucky to have been able to look at all four of these together in one place today. You know, you learn a lot more about guns like this by seeing them in context. So if you enjoyed it, make sure to tune back in. So if you enjoyed it, uh, please consider checking out my Patreon page and helping contribute to keep the website going. And uh, stay tuned to Forgotten Weapons for more early semi-automatic rifles.